So hello and uh, welcome everyone to our Backup Recovery Office Hours session uh, for May. My name is Tim Chen. I'm the Director of Product Management, the Oracle Backup Recovery Technologies team. With me today are uh, Kelly Smith and Marco Calmasini, my team members, uh, who will also be uh, answering your chat questions uh, through this presentation. Um, our topic today is going to be on zero data loss recovery appliance, architecture and deep dive. Now, you may have attended our session uh, back in March, which was a an overview of the recovery appliance. Um, and this session goes a little bit more into detail on what the product does, how it's built, and, uh, and, and kind of how it really works. So all your lines are muted. If you want to ask a question, please use chat, and one of us uh, will be able to get back to you. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and start. So just as a quick refresher from our presentation in March, uh, we talked about the motivation for the recovery appliance. And um, the big things here are the challenges that traditional backup solutions are not designed for. Uh, typical solutions are based on storage functions and they treat databases just like any other application or file systems as just files to periodically copy. So what happens is you have kind of four key um, challenges and kind of problems that can occur within an environment, and especially with a very large number or sized Oracle database environment, they can get uh, very painful. The first challenge is data loss exposure. And that is you are only protected until your last good backup whether that was um, yesterday's full or incremental or within the last few hours you did an archive log backup. And as we know, it's a very critical part of any backup strategy. But from that point on, you don't have any backups of your data. So if any outage or corruptions happen um, during, in that uh, time, you're only able to recover to that last uh, good backup. In addition, there's no validation that is done on the Oracle database logical consistency side uh, by storage vendors such as disk uh, appliances or by tape uh, systems, for example. Only the Oracle database can do validation of its own blocks, its own data files, et cetera. So that becomes a, uh, more of a, a burden on the database administrator to have to always run RM validation and other processes to, make, to check to make sure that the backups are good restore and this can be both time consuming and resource intensive as um, database resources are used during that validation process. The second challenge was the daily backup window which was uh, essentially you have to take a full backup uh, for any normal backup strategy uh, a level zero or incremental backup we call it is needed Tim, so that Tim, sorry uh, it's, it's Marco. Are you supposed you're not you going back many many days or weeks ago for that level zero. You have one current enough that you can then apply your incrementals and then after that your archive log backups so that they can be recovered. Um, and that takes time, right, to recover your database using those files. So that daily backup window, and I said we're talking about the full backup. Uh, some people take it daily, some take it every week or twice a week, etc that can have a large performance impact on your production systems. That's gonna read and write every single block in that database out to the storage side. And that can be very painful for multi-terabyte or even larger um, size database. The third challenge is core database recoverability. What we mean here is that when you take a backup um, with RMAN um, on the database, those files go off to a uh, storage system um, they are managed by a media management uh, product, but from a DBA standpoint, there's no uh, assurance that the files are fully recoverable from that media, right? Uh, RMAN knows about those backups and expecting those backups when it does restore. But um, from a DBA visibility standpoint, um, there's little uh, perception or view into really the state of affairs uh, after the backups are written. And the fourth challenge is you have to manage many systems here uh, with a traditional disk or tape uh, appliance uh, scenario. So you have to scale up by deploying more of these uh, appliances, more of these storage systems, 
and they just keep growing and growing, proliferating throughout your environment. Now, with the zero data loss recovery appliance, we're introducing a new paradigm in terms of data protection, specifically for Oracle databases. So, as you, uh, our customers, uh, have very critical and in a lot of cases, very large Oracle environments, we know this is very important uh, in, you know, for protection purposes. We know also from our HA technology portfolio that we offer DataGuard, Golden Gate, other HA technologies. So we know that there's a demand for really Oracle aware and very insightful data protection. The, the few main precepts of the recovery appliance are that the system is designed to deliver reliable and complete recovery every time. And that is that the backups are checked, that they're validated, and that we can assure you that the backups are good as of the time they were checked on the recovery appliance and complete, that all the files are there for the database uh, restoration to happen. The second principle here is uh, eliminating the long backup windows. Instead of depending on a full backup schedule like we saw uh, on the previous slide, the recovery appliance requires only an initial level zero full backup and then just incremental backups thereafter, what we call an incremental forever strategy. Now those incremental backups are received by the appliance and are materialized as virtual full backups. Uh, this is a very important fundamental concept of the system and we're gonna drill down into that a bit later, but that is uh, a huge uh, benefit for those large databases, those large environments that still have to do with level zero full backups. With a virtual full backup, you still get full restora uh, restoration, recoverability, because there is a level zero that can be used by RMAN in case anything happens. We also mentioned the validation. So you have sort of up to the uh, moment in real time reporting on the files that are backed up, that uh, they're validated on the appliance um, has been done successfully. And we do that for all the virtual fulls that are generated on the RA uh, for every database. Through Enterprise Manager, we give you all this reporting in a centralized single pane of glass uh, UI view. And so um, in a later uh, office hour session, we'll try to give you a little taste of the Enterprise Manager UI, give you a little demo of how the system actually uh, comes together. And then finally, the system is built on our um, highly optimized, our very um, engineered from the ground up, scale out hardware and storage from our database group. The same group that develops Exadata engineered systems today is the platform at which recovery appliance is built. So it's extremely um, scalable, uh, accommodating hundreds or even thousands of clients in some cases uh, for backups. So as we get into the architecture here, um, let's take a look at kind of the overview of the architecture and how it's represented, uh, deployed in your data center. So here we, here we we have a recovery appliance that is protecting a number of databases, any version from 10 to the 12C, and it's number of petabytes of data, for example, um, and these are your typical databases today. And what happens is you have a Delta push technology, which is um, pushing this um, changes, and we call that incremental backups. And we also call that real-time redo. So you can see that the uh, redo here is being generated uh, as updates are, being, are happening on the database. So this uh, redo is the same technology used by Oracle Data Guard today. And, uh, and so it keeps all the backups on the recovery appliance up to date with the current state of your systems. Uh, on the database side. We also use, I guess, as I mentioned, incremental backups forever, which is a technology uh, very new to, this, uh, to the Oracle space and is fundamental to the recovery appliance where virtual full backups are generated uh, from the recovery appliance. And with those two things, we also have a Delta store. Okay? The Delta store is where the backups are received and where the backups are validated, that they're compressed, uh, and that they are uh, created as virtual full backups um, on disk. This allows full uh, and fast restores to any point in time. And I mentioned before that the system is built on Exadata scaling and resilience, and also uh, Enterprise Manager is our single pane of glass for NDA control of the system.
We also see that we have a um, tape backup functionality off the recovery appliance. And that is that we either, you can either use your integrated media manager that comes fully licensed with the product we call OSB, or Oracle Secure Backup, or you have a third-party backup client software, um, such as NetBackup or uh, Networker or TSM, which you may use today with uh, your RMN backups. Um, those same integration uh, modules can be installed on the recovery appliance to offload uh, and to write out backups to tape. So if you may have, say, a strategy of 14 days retention on the recovery appliance, and you have, say, a retention of 30 days or two months on, uh, on tape, for example. These can be managed in a central, centralized policy manner on the recovery appliance. Finally, here on the overview architecture is a uh, replication technology, which is the ability to keep a DR copy uh, with a secondary recovery appliance. In this scenario, you have, again, the backups and the redo being accepted through the upstream uh, recovery appliance, and all those changes and incrementals are then forwarded to the downstream uh, replica. So the replica is kept up to date, all the virtual fulls are also generated on this replica appliance. Recovery is possible from this appliance. Um, you are basically treating this appliance as represented as an independent recovery appliance being fed by the upstream. So let's take a deeper look at the architecture of the appliance. So key architecture components in the recovery appliance, as you see here, the system, as I mentioned, is built on an Exadata-based hardware platform. And what this is uh, in the current generation is an Exadata X7-2 high-capacity uh, system with an embedded two-node rack and ASM database. So all the sort of database knowledge and understanding you have today, we are incorporating within the recovery appliance. This gives us very good performance, resiliency, um, scalability for many uh, number of clients or databases that need to be backed up. This internal database also hosts our recovery catalog, which stores all the backup metadata for those virtual fulls, as well as all the archive log backups that are created on the system from the incoming redo. Right. So you can also use this recovery catalog uh, for any general purpose with RMAN, for example. Um, Everything is represented through standard interfaces as you are aware today. Now we have a ASM disk group called the Delta Store, and this is where the backup data is, is, uh, is actually written to and stored using our own compressed format. The Delta Store is a normal redundant uh, disk group, so it is, um, it is mirrored and it has another copy of that data stored on another um, failover disk group. The recovery catalog database disk group is built on a high redundancy or triple mirrored disk group, which is our best practice for databases on X data today uh, in general. Now on the tape side, if you choose to use the pre-bundled Oracle Secure Backup tape software, the connectivity to that uh, tape system is through 32 gig QLogic fiber card support. Actually with X7, uh, we have upgraded to 64 gig uh, as well. So this is actually uh, uh, a more um, higher performing uh, fiber card that we have today available. And on the protected databases, we have the RMAN client that you normally use today, and we have a recovery appliance backup module that is also stored on those protected databases. And finally, the other major architecture component is the EM cloud control, uh, the 13.2 support. And uh, you have a special recovery appliance plugin that allows you to monitor that system. As I mentioned, we support all supported database versions today under the Oracle uh, official support policy spanning back to 11.2, 12.1, and 12.2 protected databases today. Now, we do have customers using 10, some customers using 10.2 databases, 
and uh, and are and they're working for them. So even though they have slipped out of official Oracle support, uh, those databases have also been used by uh, customers and others. So from a configuration hardware perspective, let's take a look at the components there. Each rack of recovery appliance, and this is X7, is our latest generation, comes with two compute servers with high-speed connectivity. On each of the compute servers, we have an onboard 210 gig copper ethernet port, and we also have two 10, 25 gig optical ethernet ports. So you have a choice of the copper or optical um, for uh, your ingest and or your replication, as you see here. There's also a PCIe card that comes on the system with two 10, 25 gig optical Ethernet ports. So these are, uh, these are auto negotiating uh, ports. So depending on the network traffic and connectivity you have from the client perspective and your switch, it'll auto negotiate to the 10 or 25 gig as needed. So the rule here is that you can have a maximum of either two 10 gig or two 25 gig Ethernet ports for ingest, and you can all also have the same limits for replication. As I mentioned, there's two 32 gig fiber channel ports uh, uh, for tape connectivity there. So you do have quite a bit of ample connectivity uh, coming out of the recovery appliance. From a storage server perspective, we have three storage servers that constitute what we call a base rack. And each of these storage servers has 12 10 terabyte disks. The usable capacity for the backups on a base rack is 119 terabytes. When you look at the uh, full or the um, raw capacity on the system, it is more than 119. We do use space, as I mentioned, for the catalog database uh, for the, for the uh, management of the system and storing the metadata for all those virtual folds and other backups. We also take up some system space for uh, secondary purposes and for supporting components in the system. So the number you just need to remember here is 119 terabytes for the incoming backups. As you grow and as you need more space, or as, say, for example, your attention increases uh, because of your business requirements, you're going to need more storage over time. And with every storage server that's added, you get approximately 40 terabytes of usable, usable capacity uh, per st storage server. So you can add those progressively. Um, the system can be expanded um, into a single rack up to a maximum of 18 storage servers with a maximum user capacity of 729 terabytes. As you can see with the uh, expansion kind of build I'm doing here, you start with a base rack and as you expand up to a half rack, you get a commensurate more number of uh, usable capacity into a full rack. And then finally, if you go to a maximum of 18 racks that can be clustered together, you get up to 13 petabytes of usable capacity. What you see by usable is the actual physical usable capacity that can be stored. What you see as virtual capacity here uh, represents the incremental forever virtual full concept. That is, when we take an incremental backup you generate a new virtual full with only that um, incremental uh, backup, plus obviously the blocks from the previous incrementals and the initial full that was done. So the additional space, you don't need to back up, and that translates into higher uh, a virtual space of really how, how much space can this, uh, how, much, how much database backups can the system hold using the incremental flow strategy. And you can expand previous generations X6 and X5 recovery appliances with X7 storage servers and with uh, full usable capacity that 40, 40 terabytes per server. So let's take a look at uh, the virtual full backup and the real-time reader transport uh, areas. Now as I mentioned, we have this really novel technology we call virtual full backups. And this eliminates the need to have to take those regular, you know, time-consuming, production resource-consuming backups as before. And you start with your, uh, in this strategy, you start with a level zero, okay, on day one of your backup. 
and then you, you create an incremental. Right? The incremental is just the blocks that have changed since the previous day's, increment, uh, previous day's backup. So when you take your day one incremental, as you see here, you automatically generate a new virtual full in that recovery catalog on the recovery clients with a new virtual full. If it's a new level zero, it'll be represented as such in the catalog and can be restored as well. And you create more incrementals over time and you get subsequent virtual fulls as you see here. Because of this um, efficiency, you can, you can get magnitudes of, of space savings, right? Um, you, we can typically see 10x less space consumed for the same amount of backups that you would take um, for like a 10% change rate uh, using a full backup only strategy, for example. It's quite, um, quite efficient. You can keep any number of virtual fulls as long as you have the space. And um, the space is also managed for you, meaning that old virtual fulls are deleted as the retention window slides um, going forward. In, a, in essence, um, we, we have metadata that uh, points to various blocks in every uh, backup that's taken, and these blocks constitute a real physical full backup that can be used for any RMAP store purposes. So another level underneath is how this backup uh, technology actually works uh, for the virtual fulls. This is called our Delta Push, a part of our Delta Push workflow. So we start with an ARM and backup that's sent over. The system is receiving these via HTTP. So we have the uh, module, as I mentioned, installed on the database server. And these backups are sent over HTTP, a very efficient protocol. Um, the backups are chunked into smaller sections that can be passed um, very efficiently over the network, whether it's local area or wide area, uh, as the case may be. And uh, from the HTTP server, they are then validated by another process. So we make sure that the backups are checked as soon as they come into the system. When the backups are written to Flash on the storage server, each storage server comes with uh, quite a bit of Flash. Uh, Next 7 comes with 6 terabytes of usable Flash per storage server. It's also normal redundancy on the flash for HA protection. So you don't, in, you don't induce any I.O. when you first write the backup to the appliance. That's one of the reasons why this system can be highly performant and scalable is we have quite a bit of flash and can hold these backup sets uh, on flash until they are processed. So the next stage is that they are indexed. And this is what we call the index uh, backup task, which essentially pulls those backups from the flash as they are uh, written there, and then they are, com uh, val they are compressed, and then they are written to disk as virtual fulls. And these are brand new file types in the Delta store, as I mentioned uh, before, and uh, we validate those on a periodic basis. Now, the real-time redo also comes into picture here, which we'll discuss in depth in a bit. The redo blocks are sent in real time. This is asynchronous redo transport, as you're familiar with, uh, with DataGuard. So you have any number of these database clients sending their redo uh, in, in real time. There's an RFS process or file server process that receives that redo. The redo blocks are validated, okay? And then they are written to the Delta store as archive log backups upon every archive log switch on the protected databases, right? So you do get an archive log backup at the end of the day. It is cataloged, so you can look at that through the recovery catalog and the same list backup or other commands that you have um, with RMAN. And um, the other benefit here of the redo transport is those archive log backup jobs that you might have taken every hour across you know, hundreds and thousands of databases, those are no longer needed and you can simply just send this in background. The redo blocks are sent in background in a lightweight process. So you do offload a lot of work uh, from the production database as well. The tape uh, offload and the replication process happens in the background. So as the backups are created, they are queued uh, to be sent to tape. If there's a tape copy policy that was specified for those databases, and we can create uh, full backups, incremental backups, or archive log backups off the tape. These backups to tape are normal RMAN formatted backups. So you can take those backups on tape, ship the tapes to another location, and direct restore them directly to another database in that data center without recovery appliance. 
So the tapes are, uh, are purposefully built to be R-man uh, formatted backups for portability uh, and use in other locations. The replication process uh, is also queued. So you can see the incrementals are queued up and they are sent over to the downstream of a replica appliance where they're processed and, and indexed as well. Once they're indexed, there's a process that in the background which reconciles or pulls the metadata of those new virtual fulls into the catalog on the upstream. So your upstream recovery appliance has full awareness of its own backups and the backups that were created on the downstream and can be restored transparently if needed uh, by, the, uh, by your database clients. So kind of a pictorial description of the incremental backup for, uh, forever strategy you can see here is we start with a level zero and we have day one, day two, day three, and we've represented the different blocks that change in each of these backups. When the virtual full creation kicks in, you have new metadata created that have pointers to those uh, blocks that are, haven't changed from the uh, relatively older backup. So you can see here we have in day one incremental pointers to A0, B0, and E0. And we also have uh, references to the new blocks that have changed, C1 and B1. And so forth and so on. With day two incremental, we are creating pointers back to the uh, blocks that haven't changed. And again, with day three incremental that you see here. So again, very highly efficient, um, only keeping the changes needed, yet you're still getting full restorability, point in time recoverability uh, with this method. Redo transfer, as I mentioned, is, is leveraged from DataGuard technology, so it's very low impact, asynchronous redo shipping. In the event that if you have a connection that's lost, the appliance actually has functionality internally to terminate what we call button up any received redo and create what we call a partial archive log backup. This will actually preserve your recovery until the last change that was received by the appliance. So you're still getting zero data loss um, as the product name uh, uh, states. You're still getting very up to the last sub-second worth of uh, change protection. When that connection is reinstated, we have a gap detection process on the appliance that will automatically fetch any missing logs from those protected databases. So everything will be caught up, those partial archive log backups will go away, and you'll have complete archive log backups as, uh, as uh, back to normal. From a restore perspective, the advantage of using virtual fulls is that you don't need to apply those incremental backups in a traditional RMAN backup strategy. So we have our restore command from RMAN, say going, give me my, my database restore to day N, and RMAN will look into the recovery appliance catalog and see which level zero, doesn't matter that they're virtual fulls, they're still at level zero type uh, representing the catalog, and request those backup pieces from the recovery appliance. The recovery appliance will take the den, day N virtual full, recompose, that physical full backup using all those reference blocks and return those back to the RMAN client that's doing the request. So you basically, uh, essentially on demand, created a new full backup uh, on the fly and no incremental restore and apply or merge of those incrementals are needed. And again, the restore process gets all the benefits of the underlying exadata hardware architecture. Restores are prioritized over other tasks in the system. So you get uh, uh, very high priority um, attention from a resource and performance perspective for any restore operations that happen. Underneath the hood, let's take a look at the restore workflow. We do the restore database, so again, going through RMAN and uh, through the RA backup module. Request comes in through the HTTP servlet and the backups are then composed. So you can see here we have the virtual fulls that are reassembled into the physical full backup. Any backups that are needed from tape, remember that the catalog in this recovery appliance knows about the backups that were copied to tape. It knows about the backups that were replicated to the downstream. So it can retrieve those transparently um, as needed, as you see here. So 
if any backup, say for example, um, are no longer on the disk on the recovery appliance, but they're resident on the tape because it's an older point in time that needs to be recovered to, then you can it will automatically pull those off from tape as well. So all those backups are validated before they are prepared for network transmission and returned back to the database that's requesting it. So you get many touch points where validation is done. Not to mention the RMA client itself has built in validation both in the backup and the restore operation. So um, we do try to guard against any possible uh, uh, introduction of any corruptions. There. From a recovery database operation perspective, we see that the command does come in again, similarly from our man, and the archive log backups are retrieved as, as necessary. So you're only going to apply any um, archive logs that were generated after that last virtual full was created. Right? So uh, if you take your full incrementals every day, you have up to 24 hours worth of uh, archive log backups, for example, that, that might be restored. And then they are returned and then applied as normal onto the database side. Okay, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about the tape backup and replication side of the house. The tape backup data flow consists of a few uh, items here, as you see. Um, the first step is to create what we call a media manager object in the recovery appliance. This is um, a path name to your RMAN plugin module or to the OSB library, if you're using the pre bundle of the OSB product and also specifies the number of total tape drives available for recovery appliance and any dedicated tape drives for restore purposes. If you have uh, specifically for, uh, a subset of these drives that can only be used for restore, and customers do this for performance purposes, so you're not having to use, this, uh, if a backup is going on the tape, the same drives have to be contending to do the restore. So you can have sort of isolation of uh, backup and restore operations across tapes. You also create an attribute set, which is a media family, the number of copies you want to tape. Um, these are all kind of set up in a policy. We call a copy to tape attribute set. Then you have what we call a copy to tape job template. And this is specifying the media manager that you created, the attribute set, and a protection policy or protected database. A pr protection policy, um, we'll discuss just a bit later, is um, the mechanism by which we group databases according to their retention or recovery uh, attributes. How long you want to keep backups for, level, the level of data protection you want on those from the reading transport perspective. Um, so you can assign a database or any number of databases for copy to tape. Copy to tape can be a full backup that, that can be done on, a, on your own uh, regular schedule, incrementals, archive logs, or everything uh, above, right? You want everything copied during the job. And we do this that we call a queue copy to tape job procedure. So um, when you execute this queue copy to tape job, this uh, job takes into account the current picture of the system. The most recent full backup, if, you, if your type is full uh, prior to, to today's time, and all the incrementals, if you specify incremental relative to that last full backup, and all the archive block backups, relative to that last full backup. So make sure that everything is complete and operational uh, uh, backed up so you can do recovery from tape uh, from any point in time. So the operation happens by a full backup first being taken, as I mentioned, then those incrementals are then taken as well as the archive log backups are taken off the tape. So these are background processes. They can happen uh, later on after the initial backups are taken, but the system is designed so that we only we get the actual backups that are as the version that you did when you executed the queue of the tape job procedure. For replication, we have an upstream and downstream as you see here. When you add a protection policy, as I mentioned, this is a can be one or more databases with the similar recovery window attributes. You can add those to the upstream appliance that we call a replication server object. And then all future incremental and archive log backups will be queued for replication. The first backup that's replicated is the level zero, right? You, also, you always need a level zero to seed the strategy. And then every level one and archive log backup coming in gets queued and sent over. 
the new virtual full records on the downstream are synchronized to the upstream periodically. And as I mentioned, that's the reconcile process. And then we have uh, the ability to adjust the number of concurrent replication streams based on your available network consumption or your data center environments. Finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, the way that the system manages retention, time, and space. I was mentioning this protection policy model in the recovery appliance. This is basically a policy that you set up one time and you can add any number of databases to a policy. In this example, we have three policies, gold, silver, and bronze. The gold policy is what we call customer critical. And for this, the needs are a disk retention of 35 days and of tape for 90 days. For the silver policy, we call internal critical. These are 10 days retention on disk and 45 days on tape. And then finally with bronze, we have three days on disk and 30 days on tape. You can assign any number of uh, days for retention to, to your policy. And the recovery plants will internally manage the space uh, so that it can accommodate that retention time. Along with that, um, with the retention window, we also allow you to specify what we call uh, unprotected data window uh, threshold, which is for this policy, what's, you know, how far back can I afford in terms of um, uh, data loss before I get alerted? With, you know, with real-time Ruby transport, you should be very current, less than one second operation speaking, right? Uh, or zero. If you have a threshold set for say, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes, you're basically letting the recovery appliance alert you if there are issues with that redo transport. Say you have a network interruption or you have issues with the client database um, or any other issue, you wanna be notified that you're behind. And this is kind of goes to the sort of the fundamental principle of the system delivering recovery, you know, very reliable uh, and, and fast recovery. So you can specify that threshold, we call again, unprotected data window threshold, and that can be done on a protection policy level. On the replica, you can also have that same policy, uh, same or different policy specified for those virtual fulls that are created on the replica. You may have say the 10 day disk retention on the upstream recovery appliance, and you wanna say 20 days disk retention on the replica for whatever business uh, requirements that you have. This enterprise manager screenshot hopefully can show you exactly the metrics and kind of the, the value of being able to get all these uh, new recovery attributes through the protection policy. We have here two databases uh, shown here. We're going to focus on Astoria here, which is a 12102 database. It's under the protection policy of Silver. Um, it's about five terabytes, as you see here, uh, size wise. This policy has a 10 day recovery window goal. So that's telling the recovery appliance that this database in silver policy uh, needs to be, its backup needs to be held for at least 10 days. So you can achieve any point in time recovery during that time. Currently, the system is reporting that the backups on the system can satisfy a six day recovery window uh, you know, currently. So we're not quite at 10 days. Maybe we have started our backups only six days ago, so we haven't uh, fully gotten to the 10 day mark, but this will tell you in real time how far back you can, you can go. And this is again, based on validation, that you have a complete set of files for those virtual folds, and you have um, that the backups are, are, have been validated and checked, so that it can be restored without corruptions. You also have this metric called needed space. Needed space is very interesting in our system because this is a, dynamically generated metric based on the historical activity of the backups for this database and the size of the database, it can calculate in the future in steady state how much space you're gonna to need to allocate for this 10 day recovery window goal. So you can see that um, we're currently using here 2.5 terabytes of space. Right? Uh, we have told this, uh, we have specified in this database to keep at least eight terabytes of reserve space. Reserve space is a concept which is a floor or a minimum 
of how much space needs to be devoted to this database of backups. And you, you set this based on kind of a general uh, estimate of how much space you need for the retention. So in this case, we say it's about eight terabytes you need for reserved. The needed space is coming up to be about three terabytes right now. We can monitor this number over time. And if needed, we can actually reduce the reserve space. If we don't need that full eight terabytes, we can reduce it and, and free up space so that you know, it can be used by other new databases or other databases that are uh, existing. We also see this concept called deduplication ratio, which is here 10 to 1. And this is actually um, a good number to, to keep an eye on because this is telling you how much savings that you're getting by using this incremental forever strategy versus using full backups. So what this is saying is, based on the backups taken to date, you can keep 10 full backups in the space of only one full uh, with a traditional strategy. So you're getting quite a good pin of a good savings. You, know, you can kind of tell that if you, as your change rate is a small percentage of your overall database size, you can get very high deduplication ratios here, uh, indicating the relative, uh, si relative sense of savings uh, on, the, on the system. Very important if we're looking at unprotected data window. Uh, I mentioned that you can set a, uh, a threshold that we call the unprotected data window goal here. In this case, we don't have it specified, but you can say that um, uh, you, know, you don't want it over five minutes, for example. Right? And you want to be alerted if it's lagging, the redo, or archive log backups aren't being received within five minutes. Uh, right now, in the system, we're, we're monitoring less than one second um, of unprotected data window. So the current RPO is less than a second. This is what we expect with asynchronous uh, redo transport. In steady state, you could be getting zero uh, as well for the, for the lag, uh, if you monitor the redo lag as normal. So it's, it's, what, it's uh, good behavior right now uh, for the system. Excuse me. Uh, and we also see on the left side, just to highlight here, um, some, met, some bars here that indicate the um, current recovery window that's achievable, right, with six days. Uh, the goal here was 10 days and the light blue mark. And then we also see here on the right side of this bar chart um, how much space is used, which is about 2.5 terabytes. And um, how much is needed is about 2.7 terabytes. And our reserve space is, is way above that, with about 8 terabytes. So we're in a good spot right now from a, a system uh, state for this database. So just in summary, you know, we covered a lot um, in the session. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for Q&A uh, for your chat questions or anything else you might have. Uh, but to summarize, you know, the recovery appliance does provide unique market value versus traditional backup infrastructures. Uh, we have um, a very novel technology that provides zero to sub-second recovery point objectives. That's through the VD transport technology uh, leveraged from the Oracle Data Guard solution world. Um, this also eliminates the need to take your regular archive log backup jobs, which can be very taxing across hundreds of thousands of, of databases on a regular basis. We also uh, meet the challenge of, of backup time, you know, large backup windows, where we use um, an incremental forever and change only paradigm. So we have minimal impact backups. Only, only the, data, the databases are only sending their changes uh, after the initial level zero that's done. Plus all the, um, tape processing, all the validation, backup, uh, obsolescence, deletion, cross-check, all those operations are offloaded from the recovery appliance. So you get quite a bit of savings, both on the production server resources side, and you get a dramatic shrinkage of your backup window time. We saw that in Enterprise Manager, you have database end-to-end -to, -end to recovery appliance um, uh, visibility into the uh, state of affairs on the backups of the databases. Uh, we don't treat those files as just a bunch of storage files to copy over. We do insightful things on those uh, on those backups, I'm giving you reporting metrics such as recovery window attainable, unprotected data window that's a, that's current uh, currently achieved, um, and also we give you the space management right. How much space you'll need in the future for this database based on historical activity uh, of the backup workloads. Not to mention periodic and built-in validation of all the virtual fools, all the archive log backups that are done to ensure that you have uh, the backups needed when you need, when you need to be restored. 
And then finally, built uh, the system is built on a scalable architecture that you can, you know, uh, trust really because Oracle X data engineer systems have been around for ten plus years and deployed across you know, thousands and thousands of customers. It's you know, de facto standard in some ways of the leading database uh, performance hardware platform for critical databases. Uh, we leverage the same hardware. We keep up to date with the generations of that hardware as, as new hardware comes in, as, as uh, optimizations are done uh, on, on the Exadata side. We, uh, in the recovery appliance product team, also get those advantages uh, automatically. And so you can scale out and easily protect all your databases in the data center uh, with a scale-out strategy. You can multi-rack these systems to accommodate more growth more databases and the systems act as a single unit. So when you scale out and you rack these systems together, um, you get still one logical recovery appliance target for your backups.